guard the good deposit entrusted to you by the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Guarding the deposit of faith is the mission which the Lord has entrusted to his church and which she fulfills in every age. This treasure, received from the apostles, has been faithfully guarded by their successors. All Christ faithful are called to hand it on from generation to generation by professing the faith, by living it in fraternal sharing, and by celebrating it in liturgy and prayer. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light that enlightens every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world knew him not. He came to his own home, and his own people received him not. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten Son of the Father. And from His fullness have we all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has made Him known. The 25th day of December, when ages beyond number had run their course from the creation of the world, when God in the beginning created heaven and earth, and man formed in his own likeness. When century upon century had passed since the Almighty had set his bow in the clouds after the great flood, as a sign of covenant and peace. In the 21st century since Abraham, our father in faith, came out of the year of the Chaldees, in the 13th century, since the people of Israel were led by Moses in the exodus from Egypt. Around the thousandth year since David was anointed king. In the 65th week of the prophecy of Daniel. In the 194th Olympiad in the year 752 since the foundation of the city of Rome, in the 42nd year of the reign of Caesar Octavian Augustus, the whole world being at peace, Jesus Christ, eternal God and Son of the Eternal Father, desiring to consecrate the world by his most loving presence, was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and when nine months had passed since his conception, was born of the Virgin Mary in Bethlehem of Judah, and was made man. The Nativity of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to the flesh. The good news for humanity is that God sent his Son 
to live among us from the beginning of creation, from the moment of original sin even, God promised that he would save us from that curse. And what some of us call the Proto-Evangelion, the first gospel, which we read in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will strike at your head while you strike at his heel. This is a great promise from the moment of sin that God wants to save us from that sin. And in sending us his son, Jesus Christ, in the flesh, he has accomplished this. St. Paul speaks beautifully of this in his letter to the Galatians. But when the time had fully come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. This is the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham, that God would be their God, and that Abraham and his descendants would be his people. Now, in a profound way, God has made this manifest by taking on flesh and living among us. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, and from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. This good news, or gospel, was at the heart of the early Christians' preaching and teaching. In fact, the early Christians were compelled, compelled to go out and teach this great news that God has taken on flesh to come to save us from our sin. The first disciples really burned with a desire to preach Christ. As we heard from Peter and John when they were before the high priests, they said, it is impossible for us not to speak about what we have seen and heard. They were compelled by not just the ideas or the teachings or even the truths of Christ, but by his very person. And this is the heart of our teaching. This is the heart of our catechesis. When we teach others the faith, we are not just teaching a set of doctrines and dogmas. We are teaching the person of Jesus Christ in all his many aspects. The name Jesus in Hebrew means God saves. At the Annunciation, when the angel Gabriel came to the Blessed Virgin Mary, this was the name that he gave to Mary to give to her son. In this name, the identity and the mission of the Lord are both encapsulated. God saves. This child will be God. This child is God. And this God-man has come to save us from our sins. We read in this beautiful hymn in St. Paul's letter to the Philippians that God greatly exalted him Jesus, and bestowed on him the name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess to the glory of God the Father that Jesus Christ is Lord. Just as the name of God was invoked by the high priest of the Old Testament's for the forgiveness of sins. Now, in the era of the New Testament, we call on the name of Jesus for our salvation. When we speak of Jesus, we sometimes call him the Christ, because in Scripture he has taken on this name. The name Christ or well, the word Christ means anointed. It comes from the Hebrew word Messiah. In this term, we hearken back to the Old Testament, to the priests, prophets, and kings who were anointed to fulfill their mission. So in Jesus Christ, 
we see one who has been anointed to fulfill the mission of salvation. And thus, in taking on this name, he fulfills the messianic hopes of the people of Israel. In the person of Jesus Christ, and we see this messianic kingship fulfilled, both in the transcendent identity of the Son of Man who came down from heaven, but also in his redemptive mission as the suffering servant. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We teach that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God. Now the term Son of God has been used in various places throughout Scripture to indicate various individuals. The title Son of God is given to the angels in some references, or to the chosen people as a whole, or to the children of Israel, or to their kings. This title, Son of God, really indicates a very intimate, adoptive relationship between God and his people. But now in Jesus Christ, we see the notion of being the Son of God taken to a new level. No longer is this an adoptive relationship, but a true filial relationship. We see this when Peter calls Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God, in one of his prouder moments when the Lord asked him, who do you say that I am? We see the centurion standing under the cross of our crucified Lord proclaiming, truly, this was the Son of God. We see this in St. Paul, who immediately after his baptism began at once to proclaim that Jesus is the Son of God. We see this at the Lord's baptism and at the Lord's transfiguration, both attested to by the Father himself. This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The Lord himself shows that he has an intimate knowledge of and relationship with the Father. He says he knows the Father, affirming in a profound way this beautiful closeness between Father and Son. As we read in John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. We also refer to Jesus Christ as Lord. This title, Lord, has been used throughout the Old Testament times and the New Testament times as well. It is the translation of the name of God, which we do not say, the I am who am. The name or title, Lord, has been translated into the Greek as Kyrios, like Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy. But that title, Lord, is used in the New Testament times both to refer to God the Father as well as Jesus Christ, thus equating the Lordship of Jesus Christ with the Lordship of God the Father. And the Lord himself, Jesus Christ, ascribes this title to himself when he spoke of the words of King David, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right. The Lord Jesus revealed his reign, his sovereignty over sin and death, over nature, over illness, over the universe. Every year we celebrate a feast entitled Jesus Christ, King of the Universe, to recall his lordship over time and space. And the Lordship of Jesus Christ has been asserted throughout the Church, throughout all of history, that the honor, power, and glory due to God also belong to Jesus Christ, because the Father manifested this sovereignty of Jesus by raising him from the dead 
and exalting him to glory. The Catechism of the Catholic Church really gives us four reasons why the Son of God became man, or why the Word became flesh. Chief among them is the fact that God wanted to assist us in being reconciled with him. God decided in a beautiful plan of salvation to take on our human nature, to live among us here so that we might experience that loving forgiveness, reconciliation, and mercy brought about through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. As St. Gregory of Nyssa beautifully summarizes, sick, our nature demanded to be healed, fallen, to be raised up, dead, to rise again. We had lost the possession of the good, it was necessary for it to be given back to us. Are these things minor or insignificant? Did they not move God to descend to human nature and visit it, since humanity was in so miserable and unhappy a state? As St. John reminds us, the Father sent his Son as the Savior of the world, and he was revealed to take away sin. Another reason why the Son of God became man was so that we might know God's love for us better, so that we might see God's love for us. God knew that we would desire a tangible, visible encounter with him, but he is pure spirit. And so by taking on our flesh, we not only can see God, but we can see his love made manifest in the actions of the person of Jesus Christ. Again, as St. John has told us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We see the love of God incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ. A third reason we might say that the Son of God took on flesh or became man was so that he might be our model of holiness. Jesus Christ himself told us that I am the way, the truth, and the life. He wants to be a pattern for us to follow in our lives. And now not only do we have that in teachings from God, but a visible manifestation of a life of holiness lived. Jesus is the model of the Beatitudes. He is the norm of the new law. As he instructed us, love one another as I have loved you. We have seen that love lived, and now we are called to live that same love in holiness with Jesus Christ. A fourth reason why the Son of God became man, and maybe the most profound reason why the Son of God became man, was so that we might become partakers of the divine nature. As God has taken on our flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, so Jesus Christ now invites us to take on God's divinity through our participation in that life of holiness. The Word became flesh to make us partakers of the divine nature, as St. Athanasius beautifully summarized. For the Son of God became man so that man could become God. We're not going to be transform transformed into God himself, of course, but nonetheless, we become sharers in the divine nature, God dwelling within us and raising us up to a level we could never imagine. We will only fully grasp this mystery when we are in the company of God, resurrected to glory in the kingdom of heaven. There we will know just how much we have shared in his divine life, even while here on earth.
The church uses the word incarnation to explain this idea that God took on flesh and lived among us. The word incarnation comes from the Latin word carnis, which means flesh. And so God has taken on our flesh in the incarnation. He has assumed our entire human nature in order to redeem it. St. Paul beautifully writes once again in that hymn in his letter to the, uh, to the Philippians, Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. This belief in the Incarnation is a distinctive mark of the Christian faith, as St. John reminds us in his first letter. This is how you can know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges Jesus Christ come in the flesh belongs to God. We profess that Jesus Christ is true God and true man. As we recite every Sunday in the Nicene Creed, that Jesus is God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. The Incarnation does not diminish the Lord's divinity, nor does the Lord's divinity diminish his humanity. Earlier in church history, there are many questions about who Jesus Christ was. Was he God? Was he man? Was he only God? Was he only man? How did God and man relate to one another in the person of Jesus Christ? St. Leo the Great, in his a Sermon for Christmas, beautifully quotes, What he was, he remained, and what he was not, he assumed. We teach that Jesus Christ is consubstantial with the Father, but we also teach that Jesus Christ was incarnate of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and as such took on the fullness of our human nature. Jesus Christ then possessed the fullness of the divine nature and the fullness of the human nature. As such, the Lord had a rational human soul. Because of this possession of a rational human soul, he was able to grow in age, grace, and wisdom, as we read in sacred scripture. But because he was also possessing the divine nature, he had insight into the knowledge of God, the intellect of God, the ways of God. Because Jesus Christ had the fullness of our human nature, he also had the human will, which was in accord with the divine will of the divine nature. And thus Jesus Christ placed his human will at the disposal of the will of God. Jesus Christ also had a true human body, which he took from the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. The Word made flesh assumed our true humanity, but Christ's body was finite. As we see or read in the beautiful preface of Christmas, we see our God made visible, and so are caught up in love of the God we cannot see. The Church for centuries has also promoted a beautiful devotion to the most sacred heart of Jesus, that the heart being the symbol and sign of human love also reminds us of the human heart which Jesus Christ had, which beat for love of us. In fact, if we think of our Lord on the cross, recalling that he shed the last drop of his blood for us, for love of us, we are moved to have a devotion to his sacred heart. We say that Jesus Christ was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, 
as we read beautifully in the account of the Annunciation, when the angel Gabriel said to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. The mission of the Holy Spirit is always joined with and ordered to the mission of the Son. So it is that the Holy Spirit comes down upon the Blessed Virgin Mary to sanctify her womb and to make her virginal womb fertile, to bring forth life from the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, causing her to conceive the eternal Son of the Father in her humanity. The whole life of Jesus Christ will make manifest how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. While it is true that Jesus was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Blessed Virgin Mary had a true birth of her divinely conceived Son, as we read in the historical account given to us in the Gospel of Luke. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be enrolled, and all went to be enrolled, each to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be enrolled with Mary his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to be delivered, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. People often want to know, how did you get to this place of talking about the life of Christ in the womb in the first heartbeat of the Sacred Heart? And to give a little bit of the backstory, um, I have a ministry that's embracing dementia and Alzheimer's, uh, an apostolate through the church that I've had for some time. And it's based on the journey of my late husband's dementia disease, and in the course of loving him through this um, particular journey, I began to see that hidden inside my big husband was little Frank, and then hidden inside little Frank, and in this situation, was our Lord. Because he tells us that what we do to the least, we do to him. And indeed, my husband had become the least. So, you know, I began to see, even in this situation, our Lord was hidden. And then, uh, working in collaboration with Lee John Bruno with United for Life Foundation, we were doing radio, and one day I said, you know, um, what a blessing to have been with Frank at the moment of his last heartbeat at death, and I just wondered when did that heart beat for the very first time. And I began to do research through some of the materials that Lee John had given and began to look at the development of the human being in the womb, simply trying to find when my husband's heart beat the first time, and discovered that it was 21 days after the day of conception. And I thought that was significant because he also died on the 21st day of December. But, you know, then like an epiphany, there in the radio studio of the Chancery, it just hit me and I thought, oh my goodness, it would have been the same for the sacred heart of our Lord. That when he was in the womb of the Virgin Mary, on that 21st day after the day of the Incarnation, March 25th, the 21st day after, April 15th, his heart would have beat for the first time. And, you know, this was, this was something that I knew was significant because it was the sacred heart of Jesus. I did not know what to call it, did not know how to respond to it. But fortunately, many years earlier, even before uh, my late husband's illness, I was so blessed to have uh, become a lay Franciscan missionary with Mother Mary Angelica of the Annunciation, who is founders of EWTN uh, Global Television Network. 
and had this beautiful Franciscan spirituality that, that grew and developed in me. And there was a closeness even then with um, seeing and loving and having this intimate relationship with our Lord hidden in the Eucharist. Um, sometime during that same period, I was very blessed to go to the Holy Land with Father Mitch Paqua. And, you know, thinking forward where we are today, um, back in 1995, we went to the place where the moment of the incarnation, where the angel Gabriel came and declared to Mary, Mary gave her beautiful yes, and then the Holy Spirit overshadowed her. We went to that place in Nazareth. And then, you know, scripture tells us that Mary left in haste and went to visit her cousin, Elizabeth. Well, we went there too. The place is called Ein Karim. We went there too, and this would be the place that the cardiophany, the first heartbeat of our Lord would have taken place. And so, you know, I could see the work of the Holy Spirit in progress all these years, even before my late husband's illness came to be. Now, significant also in here was uh, my wonderful spiritual director, Father Angelus Shaughnessy. He's a Capuchin Franciscan. And throughout this journey of caring for my late husband uh, and my little granddaughter, he would say, Ellen Marie, you know, always stay focused on Christ. See him in the situation. When you lose patience, see him on the cross and pray uh, for that, that patience that, that he had on the cross. And so, you know, looking back, I can begin to see how the, the framework was really laid for this journey. Well, after that moment in the radio station at the Chancery that day, uh, I knew that this was something that we would have to take to our bishop and to explore as a pilgrim. You know, it's as if the light that shone over Bethlehem at the birth of Christ, that that same light was now shining over Nazareth. and inviting the faithful, the church, into the holy womb of Mary, you know, that, that beautiful tabernacle, that first tabernacle of our Lord, and that through the benefits of historical theology and now modern science and technology, that we were going to create sort of a theological ultrasound, which is what uh, Father John Paul Kimes, he's a canon lawyer uh, at the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith at, at the Vatican, and this was his description of this, this um, article series that I ended up writing, which basically was taking me first as that first pilgrim, watching that light, that beautiful light that shone over Bethlehem, that now is shining in Nazareth, but shining inside the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary when she carried our Lord inside her. And Emmanuel dwelt among us, but he was hidden. He was hidden in the womb of the Virgin for nine months. So what did we do? We got inside the, the holy womb of the Virgin, and through the benefits of modern technology, first we prepared with a nine-day novena, an angelus, getting ready for March 25th, when the angel would appear and Mary would give her yes. And then the Holy Spirit overshadowed her, and at that moment, the conception of our Lord, that is when the incarnation took place. Emmanuel was dwelling among us. He was living inside the womb of the Blessed Mother. And as we began to look at what science told us about human development, you know, we could see that even though our Lord was this tiny little single-cell human being that might be called a blastocyst or a zygote or whatever scientific terms, this was, this was our Lord, the incarnate God, holy, totally human, but also fully divine. And so, as we united with Mary in that moment and gave our yes, you know, as the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary, the Holy Spirit was also overshadowing us. And we, too, were conceiving Christ in our hearts. And then, as we began to move forward through science and technology, all of us reading this series and were, were able to have with Christ in our hearts this moment that we could look forward to when his heart would beat for the very first time, the cardiophany, this magnanimous moment in salvation history, because even when that single cell of the sacred heart gave that little bum, bum, for the first time, it was our fully divine Lord. And all the mercy, all the love, 
all the power, the omnipotence, the omnipotence, all that was a part of our Lord was present in that very first beat of his sacred heart. Now, we move forward and under the, the um, guidance and the support of my uh, bishop, Robert Baker in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, these articles would be written month to month as a pilgrim, just waiting to see what the Holy Spirit would reveal. And, you know, it was so exciting because what was happening is that our Blessed Mother, was, who was the protector, the mama bear of her, of her precious son, was inviting us to come into this intimate place inside the tabernacle of her womb where our Lord himself at this time in history, where we have our Holy Fathers, the current Holy Father and the last two um, who have called for the new evangelization, who have called for a new renaissance, who have called, announced this year of faith as a time for renewal, for renewal of the church. And it's, it's that same rebuilding that um, St. Francis was asked to do by our Lord way back in the 13th century when he said, Francis, rebuild my church. And now we have our Holy Fathers in our time asking that. And here comes our Lord through his Blessed Mother, through modern science, through historical theology, presenting himself to us presenting himself in the most vulnerable state of his humanity, his total humanity, and inviting every heart to come into his heart, his tiny, tiny little heart, to receive his love and his mercy, to give his love and mercy, and to be a light, a light in the church. And we can see when we respond to what the the Holy Father has called the church to, and we see this response of the Holy Spirit in our time, how this renewal of faith, this intimacy with our incarnate God can take place because one heart at a time, we begin to grow in intimacy with the heart of Christ before he's even born. And as we went through this Via Gaudate series, it was called Via Gaudate with Christ in the womb, each month we would begin to see how First, his tiny little heart was beating, and then the brain was beginning to form. And, you know, it, I think it's pretty significant that science doesn't know why the heart begins to beat. They know when it beats, they know that it beats, but they don't know why it beats. It's as if by a burst of God's love, the heart, the human heart, just begins to beat. Maybe it's a sign that, you know, he's dwelling inside of us in that heart. And then I think that what is significant is that it's a matter of weeks after before the brain is able to begin to function. And at that point, we begin to see that the heart submits to the control of the brain. Almost as if you know, that moment in human development could be that, that a reminder that God gives free will to every human being. You know, because at first it's just the heart that's in charge, and then the heart submits to the intellect. And so perhaps the journey of the soul, the goal, is to get to this place where one day the intellect submits back to the will of the heart. It could be. We don't know. But as we progress in this pilgrimage and we begin to um, encounter the full human development of our Lord on the 25th of each month, looking at, you know, when did his little toes develop? When were his eyes able to blink? When could he hear the heartbeat of his mother, how did her voice and her, her words and her prayers, how did, how did they grow in relationship when he was still in the womb? And, and then being reminded that this was the presence of our incarnate God from the moment of his conception, but we just begin to imagine that we could see the angels traveling with the Blessed Mother the whole time. And so when this entire series uh, completed, went all the way through the birth of Christ, and then the epiphany, and then the presentation in the temple. Then ultimately, uh, Father Mitch Pacwa had earlier come on a radio show uh, that I hosted, and I was able to interview him about these two significant aspects of the incarnation. First of all, the theology of the life of Christ in the womb, Emmanuel dwelling among us, but hidden in the womb of the Blessed Mother. And then secondly, just to have this focus on that, that first heartbeat. And it was Father Midge Pacwa who coined the term 
cardiophony, manifestation of the heart, the cardiophony of our Lord. And it was keeping with the Greek terms that are so familiar to us in Catholic teaching. We have the epiphany of our Lord, his manifestation as Messiah, and we have theophanies of our Lord throughout uh, salvation history. So this cardiophany of our Lord was this beautiful manifestation of the first beat of the Sacred Heart. And Father Mitch so beautifully made this connection between, he said, the significance of that first heartbeat would be realized with the last heartbeat on the cross when the sword of the soldier pierced his side and blood and water poured out as divine mercy. And you know, what was so significant to me is that that 21st day after the day of conception was April 15th. Well, it was the year 2012. It was the beginning of the year of faith when we were recording this, this radio program. And I said to Father Mitch, you know, you point out the connection of the first and last heartbeat with divine mercy. And isn't it amazing that in this year, when all of this is being revealed to us through modern science and church history, that April 15th is Divine Mercy Sunday. Father Mitch, he was excited about it to say the least, but he, he said then that the significance of that fact too was that indeed it was as if our Lord was personally calling us to receive his mercy and to give his mercy in a world that is becoming merciless. So we have all of this um, historical, theological foundation to what is happening in the third millennium, the 21st century, where now here comes our Lord himself meeting mankind where we are uh, at this place in you know, digital technology. Everything has to do with what science can tell us. And so here comes our Lord presenting himself in a digital uh, way through the advances of digital technology. Um, and I'd love to also point out that in the midst of this pilgrimage, um, I commissioned with a world-renowned uh, sacred artist, Yolanda Bello, and asked her if she could, could create a sculpture of our Lord in the womb at about 12 weeks. When the sculpture of our Lord in the womb at 12 weeks arrived, uh, my partner Lee John Bruno and I were able to present these sculptures, there were four of them, we were able to present them to Bishop Baker on the Feast of the Sacred Heart, which was so significant, and present them to him, and he blessed them. And we um, have here this photograph of the sculpture, and inside is this precious little sculpture of our Lord, exactly at the size and the age that he would have been in the womb of the Blessed Virgin at the time of the birth of John the Baptist. And this is significant because, you know, the artist's rendition actually has um, our tiny little Lord in the womb given the Trinitarian blessing. And, you know, I wondered, perhaps from within the womb of the Virgin, might he have given his first apostolic blessing to John the Baptist at the moment of his birth? These are things we don't know, but we can wonder. We know that when Mary and Jesus arrived and Elizabeth heard Mary's voice, we know from Holy Scripture that John leaped with joy in Elizabeth's womb. And so I'm sure there's a lot more that uh, could be revealed to us through the Holy Spirit. But uh, this particular sculpture in the same type box, this uh, particular one is for the Vatican to be presented to the Holy Father. Uh, one exactly like it was uh, presented to Mother Mary Angelica the Annunciation earlier this year in uh, commemoration for the beautiful work that she has done uh, first as Mother Mary Angelica of the Annunciation, but particularly as foundress of Eternal Word Television Network, where millions around the world every single day see the Word become flesh at the altar of Holy Mass, and also see our Lord hidden in the Eucharist from that beautiful chapel there uh, at EWTN. At this time when there's such a culture of death, there is this uh, disregard for human life at the beginning of life, at the end of life. Now here comes our Lord being the most vulnerable, being the tiniest, and yet reassuring us that from that very first moment of, the, the con of conception, when he gives life 
And that single cell human being is beginning to live inside the mother's womb. That is a full human being. And so he shows us himself. We see him, this tiny, little, vulnerable Christ, the sacred heart framed in his own umbilical cord, reminding us of that dignity of our humanity, calling us into his very own heart, and inviting every single person to receive mercy and love so that we, in turn, can be channels of that mercy and that love for all human beings that we encounter, whether they're hidden in the womb, whether they're at the end of life in something like Alzheimer's or dementia, or whether they're in the least of our brothers in sickness, the poor, the homeless, whatever. The answer is always with our Lord, and now he reminds us of that from the womb. We say that Christ's whole life is a mystery. A mystery not in the sense that we can't grasp it or that we can't know it. It's a mystery in that it is an unfolding of a divinely revealed truth in ways that we can comprehend, ways that draw us in to that beautiful life of love, grace, and redemption. Christ's humanity appeared we might say as a sacrament, a visible sign of an invisible reality. But Christ is both the sign and the instrument of our redemption with God. What was visible in his earthly life leads to the invisible mystery of his divine sonship and his redemptive mission. There are three characteristics that are common to the mysteries of our Lord. One of which is that they are all tied in to the revelation of the Father. As the Lord himself told us, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Or as God himself told us, this is my Son, listen to him. The Lord's whole earthly life, his words and his deeds, his period of silence, his time of prayer, his sufferings, indeed, everything he did was revelation of the Father. Another characteristic of the mysteries of the Lord are that they are all mysteries of redemption. In fact, the Lord's whole life is a mystery of redemption. His incarnation, his hidden life, his word, his healings, his suffering and death, his exorcisms, and his resurrection. We will talk about each of these, but every aspect of the Lord's life was directed towards our salvation. A third characteristic common to all of the Lord's mysteries is that they are all mysteries of recapitulation. It is a beautiful summing up and starting over. All that Jesus did, said, and suffered had for its aim restoring fallen humanity to its original vocation, as St. Irenaeus beautifully summarizes. When Christ became incarnate and was made man, he recapitulated in himself the long history of mankind and procured for us a shortcut to salvation so that what we had lost in Adam, that is, being in the image and likeness of God, we might recover in Christ Jesus. For this reason, Christ experienced all the stages of life, thereby giving communion with God to all men. Remember that salvation history was a good 1,900 years between Abraham and Christ, and however many hundreds or thousands of years before that, from the beginning of creation. St. Irenaeus is telling us that in a brief span of 33 years, Jesus Christ lived the entirety of our human history to give us an opportunity to begin again to begin again in that life of grace and to set us on the path 
towards eternal life. The beauty of all the mysteries of Christ is that they were all accomplished not for him, but for us. Christ accomplished all that he did for our salvation, from his incarnation, from his death and resurrection. We recite every Sunday in the Creed that for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. Not that he needed to come down from heaven, but that we needed him to come down from heaven. So in his life, the Lord presents to us the perfect model of living. He is the perfect man who invites us to be his disciples and to follow him in that path of holiness. Christ enables us to live in him. He enables us to live as he lived. He invites us actually to live in him. By his incarnation, as the Second Vatican Council tells us, he, the Son of God, has in a certain way united himself with each man. Once again, God lovingly, diligently, and deliberately prepared the world for centuries for the coming of his Son. This event was of such great magnitude that God wanted to ensure that it unfolded in just the precise way. But we see that in the coming of Christ, all of the preparation of the time of the Old Testament converges on him. Christ becomes the fulfillment of all the rituals and sacrifices, all of the figures and symbols of the Old Testament. God announced the coming of his Son through Israel's prophets, as can be seen in these verses. There shall come forth a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Upon those who dwell in a land of gloom, a light has shone. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too small to be numbered among the clans of Judah. From you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose origin is of old from ancient days. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of course, all of the prophecies of the Old Testament culminate in the last and greatest of the prophets, St. John the Baptist, who proclaimed the imminent coming of Christ the Lord. We also see in the Gospel of Matthew the arrival of the wise men from the East, the non-believers, who even in reading the stars were awakened to the reality of the coming of a great God King. The Church every year relives this great period of expectancy in the season of Advent. While Advent only lasts four weeks, and the period of expectancy lasted 1,900 years. Nonetheless, the Church offers us in her liturgies beautiful prayers, readings from Scripture, and reflection to help us to appreciate the first coming of our Lord so that we might be ready for his second. The Gospels give us beautiful insight into the birth and infancy of our Lord. 
the great Christmas mystery is put on full display. The fact that through Jesus' poverty, the immense glory of God was made manifest. We see this lived out in the mysteries of our Lord's infancy. The circumcision of Jesus is a sign of his incorporation into Abraham's descendants, and of course, his submission to the law, and it also prefigures our baptism. The Epiphany is the manifestation of Jesus as Messiah of Israel and Savior of the world with the arrival of the wise men from the East. At the presentation of Jesus in the temple, Simeon and Anna both symbolize Israel's long-awaited encounter with the Savior. The flight into Egypt and the massacre of the innocents reveals the whole of Christ's life to be lived under persecution. And Jesus' departure from Egypt recalls the Exodus and presents him as the new Moses and true liberator. Of course, the mysteries of Christ's life were not always on full display. There is a whole period of his life which we call his hidden life, from that moment after his infancy, throughout his childhood, with a brief interruption where we are told about his moment in the temple, and then back to his adolescence, teenage years, and even early adulthood, the scriptures are silent about those times. But that life lived on our world, in our human nature, is nonetheless important for our salvation. During most of Jesus' childhood and adolescence and young adult life, he lived our life. He did the things that we do. He had a daily life where he worked, prayed, was obedient to his family, helped others in the community. It was marked by prayer, simplicity, work, and family life and love. We are told in the scripture that he was obedient to his parents, thus setting up a beautiful model of family life of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. This obedience of Christ in the daily routine of his life was already inaugurating his work of our redemption and his greater obedience to the will of the Father. This obedience, of course, was meant to restore what the disobedience of Adam and Eve had lost. That silence is broken, as I mentioned, for a brief period where we recount the Lord's finding in the temple. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph had traveled to Jerusalem. The family was on their way home. And at some point, Mary realized that the Lord was not there. They went back and found the Lord amongst the scholars, listening, asking questions, and even responding to questions. It gives us a glimpse into the Lord's consecration to his divine mission. When Mary asks why he was there, the Lord responded, Did you not know that I must be in my Father's house? This is the summary of the divine mission of the Lord, fulfilling the will of God and leading all to his house. Jesus chose to receive baptism by John, not because the Lord needed to be baptized, but because we needed him to be baptized. As we hear that beautiful, in that beautiful preface of St. John the Baptist, that John baptized Christ, the author of baptism, in waters made holy by the one who was baptized. The baptism of the Lord inaugurated his public ministry, it's why St. John Paul II placed that mystery at the head of the luminous mysteries of the rosary. Now as we proclaim the Lord's public life and ministry, beginning 
with his baptism. The Holy Spirit comes upon the Lord, thus showing us his anointing as Christ, and the voice of God the Father speaks from heaven, proclaiming Jesus Christ to be his Son. The baptism of Jesus is on his part the acceptance and the inauguration of his public mission as God's suffering servant. The waters of baptism sometimes we refer to as a reference to the uh, waters of, or the passing through the waters of death into a new life. We say that we are buried in the death of baptism and we rise up out of those waters as a new creation. It is a very a resurrectional theme. Through baptism, then, the Christian is united to the Lord's baptism, anticipating his death and resurrection. Following our Lord's baptism, he goes out into the desert to remain in solitude for 40 days. And while there, he is tempted by the devil. Satan tempts him three times regarding the mission that the Father has given him, and each time the Lord rebuffs him. These temptations recapitulate the temptations of Adam in paradise and Israel in the desert. The Lord redeems the falling in those temptations by remaining steadfast in the midst of his. These temptations, this time of trial, is relived every year during the season of Lent, where we go out into the desert for 40 days, where we seek to be purified by works of prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, so that we might rebuff the things of the world and be allowed to be raised in mind and heart to the higher things of heaven. Jesus spoke to them at length in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, where it had little soil. It sprang up at once, because the soil was not deep. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and it withered for lack of roots. Some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it. But some seed fell on rich soil and produced fruit, a hundred or sixty or thirtyfold. In the Gospel of Mark, at the beginning of the Lord's public ministry and preaching, Mark beautifully summarizes the preaching of the Lord. The Lord is quoted as saying, This is the time of fulfillment, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. This kingdom of God is an invitation for all of us to partake in the life of God through his Son, Jesus Christ. The Father's will is that all of us would be raised up to glory. As the Lord has told us, the Father desires that not one of us should be lost, but that all of us should be saved through him. And so the Lord gathers people to accompany him through this journey. Apostles, disciples, early followers. And in that we see the seeds of this new kingdom of God. The Lord then invites all people to be a part of the kingdom of God, which was first announced to the people of Israel and then to all the nations. He invites the poor and the lowly, those who have accepted the Lord's words with humility. He invites sinners, those who have gone astray, to turn back to him, to have conversion of heart, and to follow in the ways of the Father. The Lord's invitation to all of us, just like to the people of his day, was accomplished through parables, 
through teaching, and through miracles, all of which manifest to us the immensity of the kingdom of God and the goodness that awaits us. He invites all of us to the feast of the kingdom, and he invites us to a radical choice. To gain the kingdom, one must give everything. We must follow Christ by laying down our lives as he did. We must take up our cross and follow him. The Lord used many signs and miracles and wonders to show us that the kingdom of God, while being in this world, is not of this world. The Lord shows us through his power and through his miracles that he has authority over all of creation. He has authority over matter by walking on water. He has authority over nature through the healings he performed. He has power over demons by the exorcisms that he accomplished. He even has power over physical death, which he showed by raising people from the dead. It is in these mighty works and wonders and signs that the Lord reveals that the kingdom of God is present among us and that he is the promised Messiah. The signs worked by the Lord attest to the fact that the Father the Father of all, has sent him. While Christ, of course, is the King, certainly even while on earth, he gave authority to certain individuals within the kingdom of God. Chief among them are the apostles, those twelve men who are called to participate in his mission. He gave them a share in his teaching authority, he gave them a share in his authority to forgive sins, to heal, and to govern the church. As we read in the Gospel of Matthew, in that beautiful exchange with Peter, the Lord tells Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. A profound gift, a profound mission, a profound mandate by the Lord to St. Peter. The power of the keys designates the authority to govern the house of God, the church. Later, before the Lord ascends into heaven, we will see the Lord once again bestowing this beautiful authority on his apostles. We might call this the Lord's last will and testament. He has the eleven apostles gathered together, and he says to them, all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, teach all nations, making of them disciples, baptizing them, and so on. It's interesting to point out that the Lord first says that he has all power, but then he immediately sends the apostles to do the work with that power. In the mystery of the Transfiguration, as St. Thomas Aquinas tells us, we see the Trinity made manifest. The Father in the voice, the Son in the man, the Spirit in the shining cloud. Recall that at the threshold of our Lord's public life, he was baptized in the River Jordan. St. Thomas Aquinas calls this the mystery of the first regeneration which prefigures our baptism into Christ. But here, now at the threshold of the Passover, our Lord is shown in his glory with Moses and Elijah. St. Thomas Aquinas calls this the sacrament of our second regeneration, which prefigures our own resurrection to glory. During this beautiful mystery, the Lord reveals his departure in his conversation with Moses and Elijah, showing himself to be the fulfillment of all the law and all the prophets of the Old Testament, and also then speaking of the way that he would suffer as the Messiah, 
which was, of course, spoken about in the Law and the Prophets. The Transfiguration gives us a foretaste of Christ's glorious coming. It is the remedy against the scandal of the cross. It is the end to which Christ was called and to which we are called as well, when he will change our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. But we also see that it is through many persecutions that we come to enter the kingdom of God. But the entire mystery of Christ has shown us that fidelity at all times leads to glory with the Father.